Hey, thanks for watching today's episode. As always, this show is brought to you by G Fuel. As you guys know, G Fuel is a great supplement that you can use to curb those soda kicks. Uh, it's essentially a supplement that you mix in with your water. You can also try uh, doing it with milk or other liquids, but I recommend that you make sure that when you do do that, that the flavors you use are intended for that mixture. Uh, it's a great way to cut out sugar because they don't have any sugar and if you want that extra energy kick that like you would get from an energy drink, uh, this is it. It's got that kick to get you going. And hey, if you're someone who doesn't like caffeine or doesn't want that kick, but you want that instant flavor that you would get from G Fuel, there are also some non-caffeinated flavors. So if you want to try some today, you can head over to gfuel.com and use code completionist to get 30% off your order. Again, that's code completionist. 30% off your order. And hey, this week they're having a buy one, get one free special. So if you are someone who wants to try a flavor, uh, but you don't wanna risk that extra financial stress, you can purchase one today and get that second one free. Again, it's buy one, get one free right now, happening over at gfuel.com. Thanks for watching and enjoy the show. The Nintendo 64 is fondly remembered for having some of the most innovative games of all time. There are your obvious choices, you know, your 3D platforming pioneers such as Super Mario 64 and Banjo-Kazooie. There's GoldenEye, of course, which revolutionized how we think about multiplayer titles. Ocarina of Time, which both catapulted Link into the third dimension and implemented staples of all the 3D Zelda games such as Z-Targeting, which is still used to this day. There's just so many phenomenal games that broke boundaries, shining so bright Right, you couldn't help but be dazzled. Every now and then, I find a hidden gem that shines through those blindingly brilliant games, and I get to complete a forgotten classic. Glover is not one of those games. Glover is, instead, a travesty, a true trash fire. Allow me to spread the word. Avoid Glover for a million reasons, and you're about to find out what they are right now. Hey guys, I'm Gerard. And I'm head of Patreon, Alex Fossiani. <laughs> Wait, no, I'm not. Anywho, as you know, the Patreon completion bonus is always just $5. And it only makes sense if you sign up right this second. But just in case, here's a special message about what we've got in store for the completion bonus members for this month. Hey, I'm Celia from Yacht Club Games. We are so excited to do a video game AMA alongside our dear friend, The Completionist. We'll be answering questions about what our studio is up to and our newly announced title, Mina the Hollower. We look forward to seeing you there and answering all of your cool questions. Thanks, Celia. So yeah, if you want your question to have a chance of being asked in the AMA, sign up for the completion bonus again for just $5 over at patreon.com slash the completionist. At least I hope it was Celia. I haven't even seen the clip. I'm just reading the words that Alex wrote for me. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Completionist, where we don't just beat the games, we complete them. Let's get right to it, folks. Uh, it's been a hot minute since I've completed a truly bad title. Uh, I had high hopes before playing this game that Glover was somehow a secret success story, right? One of those games that just fell by the wayside because of the time that it came out. There was competition all over the place. But no, it's just bad, and that's disappointing. Let's do this. I'm gonna regret this one, aren't I? I'm gonna regret it, I'm gonna regret it. Let's go. Yes! All glory goes to the winner! Whenever you play a game, especially one from 1998 in this modern era, there is always a little bit of a disconnect, if you will. I tend to try and set expectations for myself. Going back to older games, there are often game design issues or fundamental flaws that can color the experience. And for the most part, 
I think I'm pretty good about trying to view a given game in the context of its release, especially something like Glover, which sits firmly in the middle of the early 3D era of gaming. But even taken with some huge grains of salt, Glover, well, Glover is a rough time, my friends. So why am I talking about Glover right now? Especially when there's so many creators out there who've talked to death about how bad this game is. Well, more recently, it is strangely relevant. The game as of this week is available on the PC thanks to Pico Interactive. Now, Pico Interactive is a publishing company that specializes in snapping up licenses for older titles, specifically those from the 80s and the 90s. They acquired the rights to Glover and even the unfinished Glover 2 and vowed to make the games available once again on modern computers. So here we are. This is the future. And hey, as a person who strongly believes in video game preservation, shoutouts to our charity event Preserved Play, having access to stuff like this is indeed a good thing. Even if the game in question is, well, Glover. I feel like people who are around my age who had an N64 are at least aware of Glover, which to me occupies that same space as Buck Bumble, Silicon Valley, or Rocket Robot on Wheels. Those sort of niche 3D games that you saw an ad for Nintendo Power or noticed maybe a rental from Blockbuster and then promptly forgot about it. But Glover seems like it was a pretty well-received game at the time that it came out in. It stands out from other 3D platformers with its admittedly unique concept and art direction. Glover has a thin plot, though that's not unusual for a 90s title or even modern platformers for that matter. The wizard ruler of Crystal Castle is doing his wizard thing, mixing potions and making spells, and he accidentally causes a huge explosion. His magical living glove which only have four fingers for some weird reason, fly off in the blast. Glover, his right hand, lands outside the castle and manages to transform the falling crystals into rubber balls before they shatter. Glovol, the left hand, lands in a cauldron and turns into the evil cross stitch. It looks like it's up to Glover to save the day by gathering up the fallen crystals and revive his wizard boss slash father. Now, Glover's quest is to use his unique abilities to make it through six different worlds. Basically, the goal of every level is the same. Take a magical ball to the end of the stage without dying. Players can throw that ball or ride on it like a circus performer or dribble or walk away from the ball entirely. It's a pretty unique set of mechanics, which initially I thought I was very impressed by. Glover has a suite of puzzle solving abilities like any good third person platforming protagonist. He can double jump, cartwheel, and do a big old fist slam. When he's in contact with the ball, movement options expand and the ball itself can even change forms from a bouncy rubber ball to a big boy bowling ball. There are three stages per world and also a boss to overcome at the end of each world. Bonus levels can also be unlocked by collecting all the Garibs in all three stages of a world. Garibs are basically magic cards sprinkled all over the place to encourage exploration. And yeah, Garibs is a pretty terrible name for a collectible. Every time I say it, I wince a little bit more and more. These are all the ingredients that I don't hate on paper. I like the concept of a weird magical world. There's kind of a sorcerer's apprentice vibe going on, which I really appreciate. I also think that Interactive Studios, the developers, made a smart choice in avoiding the 3D collectathon aspect, since they would of course be instantly compared to all time greats in that category. But where Glover fails is its execution. Anything potentially cool about the concepts or the world or the mechanics, is squandered. And in the end, as I approach completing this game, I've kind of come to this conclusion. Lover just didn't work for me on almost every conceivable level. <laughs> All right, kids, you know me. You know, I really don't like being a negative Nancy. It's my, how you say, brand to be a pretty decent, good-natured guy. That's who I am as a person. So when I say barely anything works in Glover, you have to know that I don't say it lightly. Let me drop this down. Not to sound like a broken record, but I love Nintendo 64 games. I can also say with all the love in my heart that the Nintendo 64 controller is maybe one of the worst ever made, specifically for third party developers. Many of Glover's problems stem from that it's kind of a nightmare to control and the controller itself is at the root of it all. And again, I get it. The directional pad on the N64 controller had almost never been effectively used. 
and that trend continues here. Players can use the analog stick or the D-pad to control Glover, and the D-pad is comically imprecise. So I stuck with the analog stick, but even with this marginally better movement option, there just isn't that polish that sets apart a good N64 game from a bad one. And then there's the camera. Good God, the camera. The yellow C buttons, often used for controlling cameras and platformers, in this case, are just terrible here. I shouldn't have to say it, but here I go. Bad camera plus bad controls equals a very bad time. This is a game full of bottomless voids, and I fell into too many of them because for some reason or another, I couldn't line up the camera correctly to see where I was going. The one saving grace of the camera is that you can switch into first person mode, I'm sorry, first glove mode and peek around to get a better sense of how to progress. But even then, movement is not possible from this perspective, so I still had to zoom out once I figured out where I needed to go. Now look, perhaps I am being unfair. The N64 was kind of a testing ground for what would eventually become very standard. But I can't imagine the PlayStation version of Glover that came out the year after the original felt any better to control, even if the controller made more sense. And hey, who knows? In its more modern PC port, maybe those two components will be somehow smoothed out in a more palatable experience. But from my play experience and what I got to play here, things were looking rough. There just isn't much of a foundation to build upon here. Though apparently Glover 2 is still in the works, so I might be proven wrong in the future. I would love to be proven wrong. Quibbles with the camera aside, there are also some baffling mechanical choices in Glover that impact about everything. Much of the game centers on manipulating the ball by throwing it or riding it around, but it always feels a little off. Riding on the ball feels weirdly fast, getting off the ball feels a little too slow, pushing the ball is, I guess, the optimal way to move throughout a level, and even then, that never quite works the way I hope. In a perfect world, switching between all of these different ways to interact with the ball would be fast-paced and exciting. Instead, I had to deal with things like the fact that the controls invert when Glover rides on the ball. The amount of endless voids I careened into because I suddenly had the directions flipped on me would be funny if it wasn't so frustrating. Okay, look, I can struggle through a bad camera. I can even put up with busted controls if there's something else to latch onto. Yet, Glover Six Worlds are nothing to write home about. For one thing, this game has the draw distance of the original Silent Hill. Like, I sincerely thought I'd start hearing radio static and get attacked by a flying monster at any given moment. But even when I could see what was in front of me, I wasn't exactly blown away by the presentation. I mean, I guess I liked the weird space level, and Atlantis is kind of cool. Everything else just feels extremely disjointed. The whole theme is like kooky magical realms and the beings that inhabit them, but I don't see how pirates fit into that. Or dinosaurs? Look, I've completed many, many strange games before, but Glover feels like it's going out of its way to be more bizarre than it has any right to be, and none of those decisions feel earned or warranted. I just feel bad because it feels like I'm hating on a bunch of people who worked on a game from a long time ago, and who knows, they might even watch this and feel bad. I hope they don't. If you do work on this game and you're watching this video, uh, one, I'm really sorry, and two, I hope you're doing something that makes you happy. All right. I like it when things get weird, please don't take that out of context, internet, but Glover falls into the type of weird that said yes to the first idea, thrown out, but didn't necessarily believe in it. It's an amorphous, visionless, weird thing that leaves you more perplexed than entertained. So for instance, the hub world is full of evil laughter of cross-stitch. This could serve as great motivation for the player, but the laughter doesn't feel ominous to set the stage because it just keeps going. Every boss fight is more perplexing than the last. They're pretty basic for this kind of game, essentially just different variations on hit this thing three times and you win, which let's be real, that's the standard structure for a platformer. But these bosses don't really have personality or memorable design elements or anything whatsoever. The first boss at the end of the Lost City of Atlantis stages is literally just three fish stacked on top of each other. What even is that? At the end of the carnival stages, I had to fight a damn clown. We're not dealing with Sweet Tooth here. Instead, this is like a, a bad cosplay of the clown from Spawn, the one that's played by John Leguizamo. Super weird. And that's the main thing about Glover here. It feels completely all over the place 
from every angle. Power-ups feel like they don't fit or serve any specific purpose, and even though the ball can transform into four different forms, it never feels particularly good or cool or fun. Though I will add on that I do like the animation of Glover winding up and slapping the big bowling ball to smash through obstacles. That is really tight. And the music isn't half bad. There were certainly some funky bops to keep me moving along, but the soundtrack won't make any all-time lists. The bonus levels legitimately were some of the hardest things I've ever had to conquer here on the show. And I don't know if I'm exaggerating. The very first one, you're transformed into a frog and have to gather up a whole bunch of garabs. It's like Frogger, except not at all and much worse. You're a frog who can't swim, tasked with jumping around and grabbing collectibles, but the margin of error is ridiculously slim. I probably attempted this one minigame around 30 times. This minigame is different, yes, but just because the gameplay is different than anything else I'd experienced so far doesn't mean that it's all fun. Oh, right, and whenever you beat a level by bringing a ball all the way to the end and then dunking it into your goal, you've scored and your time gets recorded. Okay, so is it like, is it like a time trial? Like, should I try and beat these levels quickly? Should I try and aim for some kind of high score? No, I shouldn't. Should I try and set up some type of time trial with my friends? Like, watch, imagine, if you will, you're a kid in the 90s, it's a Friday night, you're eating pizza, and you've got an N64 and a group of friends over. You ask yourself and your friends, hey, does anyone want to try and beat my time in Glover? Top my high score? Guess what? Those are no longer your friends. You have no friends anymore because no one wants to play Glover and they definitely don't want to beat your high score and your time. Don't play Glover. <laughs> Man, not to belabor the point, but I really came into Glover hoping that I'd find something awesome here. Maybe my first impressions were too hard on the Glove Man, but no. For the average player, there's nothing to get too excited about here. For completionists, there is really nothing at the end of this particular rainbow. Finishing all 30 stages and making it to the boss fights is pretty straightforward, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but to me, Glover has an identity crisis. It isn't all that challenging, and even though there are two difficulty modes, it doesn't seem like there's that much of a difference between the two of them. There is no reason to replayed levels multiple times or anything to be gained from racking up a high score or doing things quickly. Collecting Garabs, which I just want to keep calling Garbies, like Arby's, does nothing except unlock bonus stages, which in turn have more Garbies to collect inside of them. I would hesitate to call bonus stages a good reward because they don't feel very bonusy except for changing up the normal gameplay. Every level has varying amounts of Garbies, amounting to 1,496 Garbies across every stage and bonus area. You'd think finding everyone would lead to something really, really cool, anything really, but it doesn't seem to beyond just knowing that you did it. All told, completing Glover took me about seven hours, which I feel like there's not very much to show for it. I got my fairy tale ending. Glover manages to return the crystals to their rightful locations after a terrible final boss fight. The wizard is restored and puts Glover back on. The two of them try to get Cross Stitch back on the program, but Cross Stitch does the smart thing and tries to escape from this universe. But freedom is not in the cards. Wizard and Glover turn Cross Stitch back into Glovel, and the wizard puts the glove back on. You then get a sepia tone freeze frame of the wizard doing a double thumbs up, and yeah, that's the game. I guess there's a bafflingly long credit sequence and this good job screen at the end, but I am not even sure that it's tied to collecting everything or if it's just something that is shown to everyone who beats this title. Now, there are cheat codes in Glover, but to me, they don't add anything super fun or interesting. Instead, Glover feels strangely empty. The two things about Glover that stood out to me the most are, one, he's got a creepy little smile on his face most of the time. What are you so happy about, you weird fingered glove? What's that smile for? And two, if you hold down the Z button, Glover can lie down on his back and stare at the ceiling. Now, I use this a lot, only to question why on earth I had bothered to complete this game, and that was more meaningful to me than anything else I experienced in my seven hours of gameplay. Okay, so look, I thought it might be fun to complete a game that is rarely discussed positively about from this era, right? Everyone loves to crap all over Glover. And I thought, you know what, maybe my optimism, maybe my ability to look at things with a different lens, maybe my ability to share some insight might give this game a new, fresh, interesting coat of paint. Instead, I had a miserable time completing Glover. 
Look, I felt like I gave it every chance I could because I really wanted to give the game the benefit of the doubt. Look, there are plenty of hidden gems from the PS1 and N64 era, and this is absolutely not one of them. And it's a shame because I kept searching for something redeeming about this game, and I simply could not find a single thing to justify completing Glover. Glover is rarely fun to play. It's often frustrating to even move around in. I can put up with a lot when it comes to completion, from endless grinding to extreme randomness being a factor. But the way Glover controls and how it never, ever feels rewarding in any way, shape, or form forces me to do this. So, with that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of Donate It. Whew. That may be the most depressing Donate It I've ever given a game here on the channel. It's like, it's like being so disappointed. I'm not mad. I'm just incredibly disappointed. Donate it. Whew.